isn't it interesting that in the same week that we saw Casa Bonita Mia Moore, where you see Trey Parker take all of his money and spend it on a childhood dream, Kevin Smith, in the same week, releases the 430 movie, which is shot at the Highlands movie theater where he grew up, where he, which he then bought. There's like a Buddhist <sighs> thing about like, um, there's like three th- phases of your life. You know, there's like the learning phase and then there's like the building phase and then there's like the giving away phase, you know, and I feel like these guys are starting to be in the giving away phase, like keep things alive phase uh, before I go. They've they've built their empires and, you know, now they're both having fun, like buying their childhood and hanging around the building because like Kevin was (laughs) working in this place, you know, at the movie theater for like months on end during his mental break. Yeah. The movie four thirty <laughs> not good. <laughs> I'm afraid not. Well, I, I, here let me. I, I think if I were to make Kevin Smith tears, not like tears, like he's provided plenty of those. Yeah. So w- while the first season of The Flash is playing, <laughs> <laughs> plenty of those. But the, if there was um kind of pr- prototypical, you know, S tier Kevin Smith, your clerks, your 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 dogmas, right? There, there's there's like movies he's made that ever you know that made him who he is. Then I think there's like a step down, like perfectly serviceable movies that most people like, like Zack and Mary, let's say, or um, I don't know. Mall Rats or... Yeah, something, you know, Mall Mall Rats may be in that S tier. Maybe Jane and Bob Strike Back would be in that second tier or like maybe, you know, even Jersey Girl like has survived pretty well over the years. And then I think there's a third tier, which is like Twilight Kevin Smith, where the movies like aren't unwatchable, but they they're not working. They don't work. (laughs) And I would say this is in that tier. And I would put like Jay and Silent Bob Reboot, Clerks 3, probably a few others into that group. And then there's, there is a fourth tier, which is like dog shit, not worth your time, <laughs> like super offensive to your senses. Um, like Kilroy was here and mm-hmm. Yoga yeah, Hosers, you know, just completely, you know, that pilot, the, uh, uh, what was it called? Some, some marijuana related <laughs> pilot <laughs> stoners, weeders. I don't know. I don't remember it. So I would, I would put the four thirty movie in, in that third bucket where it's like, this is just not very good. Like it's, hmm. I can get through it and not, it doesn't like assault my senses per se. For those who don't know what the movie is, it's autobiographical man and shit like that. Of course it's about Kevin. The, the characters are in high school, but I know him well enough and have listened to, you know, I've been a fan long enough to know the golden age of his life was the college years that he, there was before he went to the Vancouver school. And when he decided not to go to college that period of time where he met like Walter and Brian and yeah, he had this girlfriend, Kim Lochran. I feel like this kind of represents that era of his life more, but he said it in high school, his real life daughter's boyfriend, Austin plays him. Supposedly he was going to get, he tried to get Harley, his daughter to play the love interest, but she was like, that's weird. Um, yeah, it is. It is weird. I still think it's, I think I just, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. (laughs) It's a little strange. (laughs) So it's about, you know, he, he plays a a heavy set film fan who's trying to get with his, with a girl who he made out with in a pool the previous summer and antics ensue at the movie theater. And of course, Kevin shot it in his real movie theater and it's, it's saccharine. It's kind of, it's like, I think it did ultimately get an R rating, but it's, it's more PG-13. It's a hard PG-13, I guess. It's got the Asian guy from The Hangover as the theater manager. He probably plays the closest thing to a character in the movie. Um, (laughs) I mean, not, not that it was written, but the guy improved his way through a character. You and I, I think, share the same critique here, which is the movie for being whatever it is, 90 minutes, every scene feels like it's like seven times longer than it needs to be like every single one you can you can pick a scene it it overstays its welcome every single time and i think the that fact alone makes it feel like a like a really small movie like not much it could have been a short film and you know i I was watching him uh on some youtube video and he was talking about how this was the first movie he's made since his mental break and he was concerned that the male leads would be disappointed to not get a high Kevin Smith experience that he would not be on weed during it. Cause he hadn't made a movie without constantly smoking since cop out. So 2010, when we movie was done, I eventually asked the kids, I was like, were you guys like disappointed that like I wasn't stoned the whole movie? I don't feel like the sobriety <laughs> brought Helped us anything him. really. 
unfortunately. Yeah, it definitely seemed like he, you know, he was trying to lean into the Kevin Smithy banter and stuff like that and referencing movies and it, but it doesn't ultimately feel genuine or work. <laughs> so You want you want to hear something offensive? Yeah. I was listening to Fat Man on Batman and they they had seen Beetlejuice Beetlejuice and he was like Oh man, it was you know it felt a little bit long, like it was really kind of kind of bloated and shit like that, and it was like two hours long. And, you know that's all right. Uh, I'm I'm just I'm a really tight editor. I'm really economic with my no. scenes. You know I got I got uh, the four thirty movie down to a nice tight ninety minutes, man. Like no fat on the bones, man. I was like, oh, there's no, there's wrong. fat on the bones because you have no story. So every one of those ninety minutes feels stretched. Yeah, I feel like like half the movie that it was like scenes of them getting kicked out of the theater like every single second it didn't feel like there were any catalysts towards any of the action and then one of those many times one of the friends blew up at one of the other friends i was like this wasn't really i don't feel like this was led into at all and it becomes the third act break where they hate each other and there's also there's just like um a lot of this happens in kevin smith movies where one of the characters is saying something that the audience isn't buying into (laughs) and one of it was like they kept calling the girl the cute girl that he wants to date, um, a midget. And I was like, she's not especially small. (laughs) I mean, like as far as I could tell, and they were calling the guy short too. And I was like, I don't, I feel like I don't have any like point of reference for their height. I asked Nina, I was like, why do you think they're doing that? She was like, maybe it's because even though like he makes a couple of fat jokes about the guy, maybe he doesn't feel comfortable making like nonstop fat jokes, like body shaming Uh... jokes the whole time. So instead of doing fat jokes, he did short jokes. Yeah, there were some things that made it definitely feel like a throwback because there was a lot of like, you know, sex jokes in it. And yeah. I feel like I don't I don't see as many sex jokes in media nowadays. Even or, just a boy yeah. wanting to have sex with a girl and pursuing it is kind of unusual. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of unusual. So I, I would have thought like you would like put it you you could you could you could put in some like old fashioned fat shaming <laughs> <laughs> at that rate i mean nobody saw it you might as well put a r word in there you know you know old fashioned 80s stuff there's a scene where because one of the characters the one that plays andrew dice clay <laughs> the, the bernie <laughs> character yeah. he's talking like the jersey guy the entire time oh i go on with way more girls in the pool than you have all right put my shirt off he uh, he's like a big wrestling fan, and he runs into like major murder, like the one of his favorite wrestlers, in a very fucking awkward scene. Oh yeah, where the major murder keeps waving at a wife who keeps waving back. I'm like, what is this blocking? <laughs> but um, yeah, he was talking about being fat. He was like, I, I grew up fat. It was, it's so unearned. I'm like, where where is the story coming from in this thing? There were some things I liked. Um, I liked Justin Long. Oh yeah, his, his character's funny. Invented this very intro, <laughs> like this, you know, overgrown, socially dysfunctional character that's like like religious, but in a, kind of an aggressive way. It was, it, I thought it was really inventive. Have you been saved by Jesus? <laughs> no, by Tony Danza. Yeah, by Jesus. Feels like every time Justin Long shows up in a Kevin Smith movie, he just invents something interesting, like um, yeah. his gay character in uh, Zack and Miri, and of course Tusk and. He even has this, he plays like a, uh, like a, a surgeon's assistant in Clerks 3. Where he's like, I, I need you to take off your pants, sir. <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny. I like the emo Kev. So if you're a Kevin Smith fan and you listen to Smodcast, he had this series of episodes where he found an old tape recorder of him recording very, very cringy, like kind of self poems, little, little dictations to himself. Oh, um, that's the case. <laughs> 24 karat keys of love. <laughs> <laughs> and he and Scott Mosier, you know, lose it with laughter. Scott Mosier, you know, and Scott Mosier's a pretty, like, even-keeled guy. And he was, he was like, doubled over listening to, Ke- to Emo Kev, as they deemed him. And in this movie, he, like, he, the guy's recording to himself. And he's saying some of the stuff that Emo Kev said. Specifically, I got a case of love. A 24 karat case of love. Nah. Uh, that was something oh, Kevin said. It, they don't play it for laughs, though, in the movie. But, uh, you know, it was a ridiculous thing to say on tape. But I don't know if you noticed, but the end credits music uh, song, all the music was written by Bear McCreary. Once again, Bear mm-hmm. McCreary. The guy who will do the AVGM movie, a Kevin Smith movie, and Rings of Power. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. And Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> he wrote uh, like an 80s inspired song called 24 Karat Kiss of Love. 
it's a nice little song, actually. It's, it came together well. So I like that. Uh, some things I hated. I don't like that this feels like a first draft. <laughs> No, oh, yeah, absolutely. It's it's the first draftiest thing I've ever ever watched. And is, isn't that really the central critique of modern Kevin Smith is that he he's just not like he's not chasing a good product enough. You know, no. he's not rewriting and doing he's not doing the Trey Parker thing of wandering around the space, making sure everything's just so no discipline. Yeah. And he said he was like, we he did say we did that to him, that it makes you just kind of like excited and thrilled by the whimsy of it all. And you stop being critical of yourself. You just are, are enjoying the fact that you're making a movie. And he's like, oh, it's great, man. Cause I end up uh, just inviting, you know, I write these characters that have nothing to do. And then actors show up and turn them into actual characters. I'm like, okay, well, why don't you write a character? You know? <laughs> yeah, uh, that'd be great. And then like hold the actor to like their performance to that. There was, I don't know if you heard the story, but he was, he, he tells it proudly all three boys were flummoxed because one of his directions was he asked them to dance to like a run DMC song in the car. And they were like, how do you want us to do it? And he goes, make it iconic. And I walked away. And they're like, make it iconic. And he's like, Oh, you know, I forget, man, that these kids don't have the experience I have. What I've learned, man, is that when I make movies, uh, people come up to me and say, Hey, you, you know, in mall rats, uh, mall rats saved my life and shit. My dad beat me to a pulp and mall rats saved me. And so, you know, this stuff ends up becoming iconic in ways that you don't know. So be iconic. Just do it. It's like, that doesn't connect any dots at all. <laughs> 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 so strange, but yeah, he leaves so much up to chance. I think he lives in too much faith <laughs> to the, to the movie that it will mm. all come out great. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give him this. I, I'm, I admire the fact that he keeps finding ways to find funding for these movies because they don't yeah. make any money. Well, when I, I turned it on, I saw like Lionsgate in the front. I was like, Oh, yeah. there's a studio. <laughs> well, <laughs> like apparently this. the story is that on Jay and Silent Bob reboot, which Lionsgate put out, it sold a lot of optical media and they don't really sell optical media all that well, but when they do, it's profitable. And so they're trying to partner with filmmakers who will sell optical media well. And then Saban, the Power Rangers people, were, um, were the other half of that. I didn't like the, the cinematography whatsoever, that blurry shit that they added. Yeah, like the blurry, like a soft focus. No, thank you. Like they try to make it like kind of golden and nostalgic, I would say. In a movie like this where you're at the movies, there's this like irresistible urge to make fake movies that the kids are watching and, and fake yeah. trailers. And he doesn't make good fake trailers. There was one. There was a, there was one fake trailer. It was like the girl running, like jogging, and then like it just kind of ends. Like that's just the trailer is just that somebody's watching a girl running. I thought that yeah. was kind of funny. But the rat, like the the one that was like Astro Blasters. They yeah, the fake movie with like yeah the beavers or whatever. And yeah, yeah shut the fuck up. You know, it's and it's like all green screen, and they have like cardboard costumes. And it's like. This is garish and strange, and I would like you didn't need to do this. I think James Rolfe made a trailer, a fake trailer for a movie called a The a Astro Blasters and the Flying Fuckernauts. Flying Fuckernauts versus the Astro Blasters. And this was <laughs> this was Astro Blasters too. So <laughs> fake trailers, fake movies. James Rolfe, Kevin Smith. Funny story. So there, you know the young lady who plays like one of the theater employees and, and encourages him to become a filmmaker? You know that scene? Right, right, right. Well, she first of all, she mentions RISD, Rhode Island School of Design. I thought that was kind of fun. I'm going to the Rhode Island School of Design, like Martha Coolidge. I, I would have preferred it be Emerson College, but RISD, you know, I'll take RISD. Um, <laughs> but she, uh, according to Kevin, he has George R. R. Martin... And Genesis Rodriguez in his in his phone as like RR or something. And so he thought he was talking to George R.R. R. Martin, but he was actually talking to that lady. Genesis like is listed. She listed herself as GR. <laughs> Genesis Rodriguez. And he offered George R.R. R. Martin like a can. He was like, hey, man, because he had gotten a text from them. And he was like, hey, you should come be in a cameo, sit in the theater or something like that. And he thought he was talking to George R.R. R. Martin. It turned out he was talking to like a real actress who he's worked with before who like you wouldn't just put in the theater. And so like once he sent that text, he had to give her a role. And that's like how oh. this ended up happening. Oh, that, that, I thought it was random. Like she was never set up before. Right. He doesn't care. She's, 
That's not going to stop Kevin Smith from, you know, he has no vision for these fucking movies. Like, I, cause I, I, I saw that scene and I was like, did we get into, like, usually you would introduce that character before, like, she'd be like, oh, this is like somebody I look up to, or I talk about movies with in the line while well, she's serving me popcorn or something. But no, it just comes out of nowhere and it's like an inspirational speech and then it just ends. I also thought like doing, like he did the, the, the trailer about like the prostitute nun but he like shows the whole trailer and it goes on and on and on. And I'm like, this is just taking me completely out of whatever movie I already was watching. I don't want to blow the whistle on an artist who indulges in things they like. Like so often that's why you're watching a Tarantino movie or something is because they're what they're indulging in is why you're watching. But sometimes, man, it's just like, hey, think about the audience a little bit here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think he's thinking about the audience. It, it's like it's like we're watching him have the experience of making a movie. I watched it twice, once by myself on the elliptical and once with Nina. And some of her, her commentary was really funny. <laughs> she was like, I think I know why Walter and Brian are so pissed off at him. Because <laughs> his friends there seem to have had a falling out with him, some mystery falling out with him. But like watching this movie, you're like, yeah, I don't know if I'd want to be friends with this guy either. She also was like, do you think that podcasting has messed him up? And I was like, what do you mean? She was like, these scenes don't feel structured like a movie. They feel like yeah. somebody who is just long form, long winded talking. Maybe podcasts mess with his sense of, of pace or something. Maybe. It's probably the weed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she, she, she was like, do you think at the end of the movie, they're going to conclude that they all have to sleep together? <laughs> <laughs> That's the ending of Chasing Amy. That would take care of everything. I, I have a note here. Imagine shooting and editing, editing this and not being aware of how it loses the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Like, well, because when you're editing, don't you have like an internal sense oh, yeah. for like, I think I'm losing them, you know? Yeah. This yeah. didn't uh, happen. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, I can, like, in theory, like a, a you know, group of friends going to the theaters, like 80s nostalgia bait. I get all that. I mean, the thing about something like, Stranger Things that there is a story <laughs> in a mo in, the, in momentum that brings you to dramatic moments and a, uh, um, a climax and there's a resolution. So um, I think it needs some of those. <laughs> the basics, the fundamentals of filmmaking. Uh, talking about the climax and, and the ending, just a s kind of a small thing, but I feel like it's kind of big too. If the whole movie is going to be about movies and about going to the movies and, and the times that we have at the movies... Why doesn't the movie end at the movies? It ends in, in like, like at a park or something. They're walking around a park and it just kind of yeah. ends. I'm like, shouldn't, shouldn't this have ended at the movies? And then, you know, as spoilers, if, if you're going to watch the, you know, I, I would, I would spare yourself, um, the spoiler and watch it and cringe for yourself. But if you don't care, the worst part of the entire film, the thing the, where you'll cringe out of your skin is there is a post credit sequence and it's the main character staring past the camera and all of his, his new girlfriend and his two friends encouraging him and encouraging him and encouraging him. And you don't know what it's about. You think maybe it's a sexual thing. Maybe they're encouraging him to go have some sex. I don't, I don't know. Even though the girl's there, it's confusing. And then they reveal, they're talking about applying to the quick stop. They have a dramatic cut to the quick stop. I'm like, come on. Like, you could have, like, made this stand alone, you know? Yeah. But like it all comes back to like Kevin, this Kevin Smithness of everything. Did you see him on St Steve-O recently? No. He, he, he went on Steve-O's podcast and Steve-O, you know, has conquered his drug addiction and has become a, a, a fascinating person as a result. Like I think a really inspiring, smart, well-spoken, insightful guy. And he's around these other guys who have done the program and they're, they're pretty insightful too. And so they all, they had basically a mental health talk for like two hours with Kevin Smith. Oh, and interesting. Yeah. It's really, really hmm. interesting. And Kevin opens up about the mental break and everything, but Kevin talks at, at some length about how he has found over the years, a lot of trouble in his relationships where it's always the Kevin Smith show and everybody has to like play a role in the Kevin Smith show if they are to be in his life at all. And that, that like strains relationships and, you know, like, yeah, the nature of his celebrity is going to cause that naturally. But I think it could be, it could be diminished if not everything was like the quick stop. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. Like, Bring him back to the quick stop. He also, it, strangely in that interview, he started, he's always really revered his mom. You know, his dad died 20 years ago or something. And his, he's always said really nice things about his mom. He's told cute stories about how she was like, um, you know, she hated clerks the first time she saw it, but she funded the movie. But all of a sudden, after his his uh, time at the facility there, he, he seems to have turned on his mom a bit. 
he's th- like talking huh. about how she has never been all that supportive and is overprotective. And there's a scene in the movie with Rachel Dratch, you know, Debbie Downer from SNL. Right, right. Where she like nags it, nags the character on the phone for a good long while and there's no point to it. Zero point to it. I think it's just to stay fuck you to his own mom for some reason. <laughs> You're like, we'll have a call in the movie theater. It's like, does this happen? <laughs> and they were calling it, like, a, what were they calling it? Emergency breakthrough? And all of a sudden, the operator interrupts us with an emergency breakthrough. Oh, there were other things, too. Like, there was, like, a like a fake movie called Bucklick, and they kept saying it. And I was like, is that a real movie or is it a fake movie? I mean, it was like, it's a fake movie. And I was like, okay, I, like, if it's a fake movie and I never get to see it, like, shut the fuck up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it means nothing to me. Yeah, saying it like it was something known, like a famous exactly. author, famous thing. Yeah. And I was like, wait, but but what is it? They never really explain it. Um, it feels like a first draft joke. Like, I'm going to replace this with something funny later. Because you do that sometimes on your first draft. Like, you're just like, oh, I know that, like, the movie they go to is significant, but I don't really know, like, what the hook of it is yet. So I'll get back, you know, I'll figure that out later. Maybe when I get to the end of my first draft, I'll I'll have an idea because I'll know where the characters went. He doesn't do that. He's, I swear to God, he, he writes these things on an, on an airplane, you know, and he's ready to <laughs> shoot it at the end of it. Just some final Kevin Smith news. He did, uh, you know, there, there was this rights battle with, uh, you know, an, an imprisoned Harvey Weinstein. He owns Dogma or owned Dogma, and they've been trying to buy it from him for years, and he, he's wanted a million bucks or something like that. And, uh, yeah, some company recently, you know, with Kevin Smith's support and involvement, successfully bought Dogma from Harvey Weinstein, so he no longer owns yeah. it. So I That's mean, nice. I guess one of the reasons to do it is the the for, the uh, the Blu-ray release is like limited and it's very expensive at the moment to get the Blu-ray release of Dogma. So now they can do like another release at least of the Blu-ray and they can probably do a horrible first draft uh, sequel of it or something. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait for Dogma 2. Jason Lee will be back even though he died in the first one, but he'll be elderly now. <laughs> And then they'll, they'll they'll shoot it at the the movie theater and yeah, yeah. it'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> and by the end of that movie, he'll it, he'll have some other physical or mental health <laughs> deterioration that yeah. he can talk about on podcasts. Oh, okay, I can't wait to see it at Fathom Events. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see this in theaters. I you know it, it came out on streaming like almost immediately. It's like they gave up quick. Do I recommend it? Yeah, no. yeah. If you're a Kevin Smith fan, I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, but I, I don't. It's not a good movie. I don't like it. I'm saying if you're a Kevin Smith fan, you know, hey, why not at this point, right? Like, why not? In for a penny. If you're not a Kevin Smith fan, no, 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 no. There's other things to watch. Subscribe to Red Cow Entertainment on Patreon for full episodes every other week.